will bring it to pass. Father, we thank you for the preaching moment. I have prepared, but God, you preach with clarity, conviction, and with power. Have your way that it might leap from the page into the hearts of your people. Thank you for the ability to preach your word with clarity, conviction, and with power, and without limitation or distraction. But we thank you and we praise you for a right now word. For a right now word. It's what we need in this season. And we thank you for it now in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. If you will give your Bibles and turn to Jeremiah chapter 29, please. And while they're doing that, I again uh, echo, it's good to see Sister McCoy back. It's good to see Deacon Gibbs back. And anyone else that may be here that I don't realize that it's been a while since you've been here. We thank God for you too. Amen. Put your hand on yourself and say, he thanks God for me too. All right. Amen. Let's go to Jeremiah chapter 29 verses 4 through 14. If you were here last week, we talked about God, you know, giving us a reason to be thankful. And if he spares my life next week, if he says so, we'll go back to that. But in, in the middle of the week, I was so confident I could take it easy a little bit this week because I had the carryover of my sermon. God gave me something fresh. And because I'm not my own and I'm bought with a price, I got to do what my Lord and Savior tells me to do because he knows what's best. All right, Jeremiah 29. It says, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease. But seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf for in its welfare you will find your welfare. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets or your diviners who are among you deceive you and do not listen to the dreams that they dream. For it is a lie that, there are, that they are prophesying to you in my name. I did not send them, declares the Lord. For thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare means good and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord. And I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. Before I give my subject, I'm going to ask if, if Deacon Rogers, if he can just get me a water. Thank you. But for the next few minutes, the Lord has led me this morning to speak to you from the subject, when good people get bad news. When good people get bad news. 
And my subtopic to that, the answer to that, when good people get bad news, what he told me to tell you is to keep living. <laughs> keep living. When good people get bad news, God's remedy is to keep living. Thank you. There are times when the news we receive is not what we expect to hear, what we want to hear, or even what we feel like we needed to hear. When that happens, it can throw us into a tailspin. Even as believers, we are not exempt. We at times hear things personally or corporately that shake us, but God yet speaks in the middle of it and in the midst of it or even in the heat of it. Come here, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. God still speaks in the heat of a situation. Hmm. He speaks in bad news. He speaks in bad situations. And I understand that this is a broad statement that covers many things and may not cover all, but let me just bring it a little bit closer to home. Last Wednesday, after a presidential election last Tuesday, there were many people who had many feelings. In case you don't know what happened last Tuesday, there were two unlikely opponents that squared off in a presidential election. There was one who had been the president before, and then there was a, a new woman on the scene who had been the vice president and still is the vice president of the United States. These two unlikely candidates squared off. And at the end, on early Wednesday morning, we discovered that the former president would now be the president-elect. Hmm. After the votes were counted, many, especially in urban African-American settings, were disappointed, discouraged, angry, grieving, deflated, pessimistic, and feeling powerless. As I said, I realized this may not be everybody's reality, but it sure was a whole bunch of folks' reality. So there are many who share their heart with me saying, what is God saying? So it pressed me to pray to find out what is he saying. And what he's saying is when good people get bad news, keep living. The wonderful thing, the amazing thing about God being strategic is that this word may not affect you concerning the presidential election, but it's affecting you at some point in your life. Mm. So God knows that even though it may not be the same bad news, that along this life we receive bad news even being good people. But whether it was the presidential election or something in your own life and heart and family, job, situation, money, family, whatever it is, my word to you is what he told me and that is to keep living. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm not surprised that God has an ever-reaching word that affects the many different parts of our lives. The same God in Jesus Christ spoke to a man who laid at a pool for many years. And after God spoke to him, he got strength, he got stability, and he got a new perspective. I'm glad when God speaks, he's able to give me strength, he's able to make me stable, and he's able to change this mind of mine. So the man who was laying on a bed somehow started walking with his bed on his shoulders. He started carrying what had oppressed him. Oh, I'm so glad that God is able to send a word that will send strength, stability, and a new perspective. He's the same God who said, let there be light. And it wasn't just light on one thing. It was light on the plants. It was light on the animals. It was light on the fish. It was light on the clouds. It was light on the people. Everything had been touched unto him just by one word, let there be. 
So why am I surprised that he would send a word this morning to reach a multitude of people dealing with a multitude of situations and he knows who has gotten bad news, where you've gotten it from, and all that stuff. But he told me to tell some good people that received some bad news, you better keep living. Hmm. So God sends a word to reach out wherever you may be. And I ask you this morning to let it reach you and put your hand on yourself and encourage yourself and tell yourself, keep living. Keep living. Oh, you're not saying it like I think you mean it. I want to hear you tell so that your situation and the hell that you have been going through and even the heaviness that you have been dealing with, I need you to tell yourself, keep living. Keep living. Because it is in him that I live, that I move and I have my being. So I'm telling myself, because it is in him, you better pass the heart and you better keep living. Hallelujah. So let's try that again for call and response in the black church. Put your hand on yourself and tell yourself again, keep living. Oh, I feel better, so much better. Here in this passage of scripture, it contains one of the most beloved passages of scripture, Jeremiah 29 and 11, where he says, for I know the plans that I have for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, to give you life, hope, and an expected end. But it's even more powerful when we look at it in its context and not just pluck out the text, but that we look at it in its context. This chapter was written by the prophet Jeremiah and the people of God called Israel or the children of Israel were in a place that they never expected to be. Anybody ever been in a place you never? Oh, y'all don't want to talk to the pastor today, but I'm not going to ask you where that place was. I just want to know if you ever been in a place that you never wanted to be. I Maybe I'm the only one, but I've been in some places that I never wanted to be, places that I never thought I'd be. And the place doesn't even have to be a physical place. It can be an emotional place. It can be a mental place. It can be a relational place. It can be a financial place. That place, so let's try this again, call and response, people. Have you ever been in a place that you never thought you'd be in? Thank you for not letting the pastor be out here by himself. The children of Israel were in a place they never expected to be or wanted to be. Here's my next question. Have you ever been in a place you never wanted to be? Not just expected. Have you ever been in a place you never wanted to be? Even though some of their own choices, the children of Israel played a role into why they were in Babylon. The children of Israel were forced out of their homeland, out of Jerusalem, into a foreign land called Babylon, and they were under a king by the name of King Nebuchadnezzar. They were being forced to live in an environment of oppression. They were sensing and they were dealing with oppression and captivity and a leader that did, they did not want or respect. Oh, I wish we knew something about having a leader that we may not want or respect. I know we don't know nothing about that here in America, that we've never dealt with having a leader that we don't. So maybe I'm just talking to myself, but put your hand on yourself and say, keep living. Keep living. They were dealing with the leader they didn't want or respect, yet they were there. And the prophet has yet to speak to the people so that they could get their minds right in Babylon. God will always send a word when the people are dealing with Babylon and the effects of Babylon and the leadership of Babylon and the captivity of Babylon and the oppressiveness of Babylon. He will always send a word. He will always send a prophet to speak to the people when they are in the midst of a crazy environment with leadership and circumstances that they never thought they would be in. So might I say that's why I'm here this morning. Put your hand on yourself and say, keep living. keep living. 
He has to get their perspective aligned with God and not their emotions because sometimes my mind is not aligned with God. Sometimes my emotions are not aligned with God and I need somebody to put the guardrails back up. I need somebody to put me right back on course. I need somebody to put me right back. God had let them know through Jeremiah that he had not forsaken them or forgotten them, but it's going to be a minute. That's what he told them. He said, I ain't forget you. I, you're not forsaken, but it's going to be a minute. For them, it was 70 years. For us, it may be four years, not four minutes, not four months, not four days. It may be four years. But God wanted me to tell you when good people get bad news, I have not forgotten you. And your job is to keep on living. Somebody needs to say this morning, keep living. How can God be in the midst of bad news? Well, I'm going to tell you. First, I would tell you that God's character shows up in the midst of bad news. And he reveals it to his people we see here in this chapter. What is God's character? It's his qualities. It's his attributes. It's his nature. Now, these are the attributes of God that I love. If I said in the black church, God is good. And all the time. God is good. See, see y'all heard that before. Y'all been here. Y'all know what. I love the attribute when you say God is good. They say I will enter into the gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. For the Lord is good. And his mercy. Y'all, I, I love that attribute. I love that he is good. I love that he is merciful. I love that he is faithful. It says, hold fast to your confession of faith, because he who promised is faithful. I love that he is loving, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, I love that he loves me. I am so loved. I love that he is slow to anger. He has not rewarded me according to my transgressions, but even though I made him mad, he didn't react and give me everything that my actions deserve am i the only one who knows that god it has been slow to anger i love that about him i love that he's strong and mighty the bible says power belongs to god as i told the people yesterday at the beginning of the meeting lift up your heads O ye gates and be he lifted up Ye everlasting door and the king of glory. Who is the king? Of, he's the Lord God strong and I love that. I love the attribute that God is able. Yes. Ephesians 3 and 20 reminds me now unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ask or think through the power that worked in us. I love that God is forgiving. He's slowed in anger but even when I mess up on the other end the Bible says in 1 John, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. But another attribute that I have to admit that I don't always like, but it's a part of God. Somebody holler and say it's a part of God. Is that God is also sovereign. Along with all the other things I mentioned, God is also sovereign. Here in verse 4, it begins by saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts. That's where the tension ends up happening. When we see God's sovereign decisions in our lives, that's where the rubber hits the road. That's where we have to reconcile our faith with his character. That God would allow this thing to happen. And the sovereignty winds up being, let me put it in common language. What it means is God knows stuff I don't know. God understands stuff I don't. God answers only to himself. God may make decisions that he didn't consult me about. I'm like, God, you didn't ask me about that now. You just went right on ahead and did that. You didn't ask me what I thought. You didn't, ask, you didn't ask me nothing. And God may allow things to happen that I don't prefer. That's what it means to be sovereign. 
But what I've learned is that some things I've gained by walking through situations instead of him snatching me out of situations. Now, I love to tell the story and I love to preach. He snatched me out. Yes. But some stuff in my life over my meager mi middle age existence, he has allowed me to walk some things out and he has snatched me out. But let me tell you some things I learned and maybe they will relate to you. In his sovereignty, he's allowed me to walk through some stuff so that I would learn to make some better choices. Because sometimes when you walk through it, You'll make some better choices the next time. He has allowed me to walk through some stuff so I'll realize I'm better than that. That's right. Come on, yeah. So he can shift my identity about myself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's let me walk through some stuff to let me know that in the mountains and the valleys, not only will he wipe your tears, he'll wipe your sweat. He'll wipe sweat, he'll wipe tears as he lets you walk through it. That's one of the things that I learned. Hmm. But he'll still take care of me, whether I walk through it or whether he snatches me out of it. In his sovereignty, he'll do it. Let me tell you this funny story. There was a preacher by the name of Lisa Fields, and she told this funny story the other day, and I thought that it was very appropriate. She talked about the sovereignty of God, and she talked about how when she was growing up, her parents would ask her and her two brothers what they would want to eat on a Friday because they got to eat out on Friday. And one brother would say Burger King, the other one would say McDonald's, and the other one would say Taco Bell. And then the father would say, I'm sorry I asked you because that just caused a whole bunch of confusion. He said, instead, we go on the dominoes because sometimes when we tell God all that we want, all that does is present confusion. So God has to make an executive decision in order to set things in order. So there, what ended up happening there was that God has made some decisions in his executive status that I didn't ask for, I didn't pick, I didn't want, but he still fed me. God have mercy. So what we got to understand is that even when God chooses something that we do not prefer or he will allow something to happen, he has still always fed me. I hear David saying, I have never seen. I have never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed. Somebody put your hand on yourself and say, keep living. Keep and if you would dare testify as, again and say, God is, is still feeding me. Hmm. He's there even when I wanted something different. Even there when I would have chose something different. Again, put your hand on yourself and say, keep living. I'm talking about this morning when good people get bad news. I would also say it lets us notice God's character, but it also calls us to not change our character. Even when we're challenged, he is calling us not to change our character. God's character isn't the only thing under consideration. My character is too in how I choose to act. Am I going to act up? Am I going to act out? Or am I going to act like I got some godly sense? Now, now see, I, I didn't even say act like I got some sense. I said act like I got some godly sense. May I submit for your consideration that the answer is supposed to be C? For me to act like I got some godly sense? Why would I do that? Our character is under consideration in the challenge, not just God's, but he is challenging our character. Because one of the things that I got several under this point is that we've been here before. For all black folk, we've been here before. I'm talking to the people of according to the book of Exodus chapter 1, who they were trying to have us continue to make bricks with straw, who they were trying to kill us and drown us from the beginning, because even under the oppression, we were still multiplying. We've been here before. 
in the midst of the tribulation, we still grew and flourished. In the eyes of an oppressive leader, Pharaoh, we still grew in. Somebody holler, keep living. We, we've been here before, not just in Exodus. I don't even have to go that far back. But before 1865, for over 200 years of slavery and oppression and separation and domination, regardless of who was in the White House, we survived as a people. We survived under people that we didn't even vote for and couldn't vote for. God still kept us. We didn't even get the vote till after 1865, and yet God kept us. People that didn't like us, that thought we were less than, God still kept us. Somebody holler, keep living. This ain't new. If we counted the amount of governments that didn't like black folk, we would probably have to count on somebody else's hands. And yet we're still here. By the grace of God. Somebody holler, keep living. We survived under black codes which wouldn't let us vote, be on juries or anything else. We survived when we were having to have sharecropping, when they stopped and they were interfering with our families and our education. We are still here. When civil rights sick dogs and hoses on us, we are still here. We are the people who sung, we shall overcome one day. This ain't new. My people are strong people. Where others would have fainted, lest they believe they see the goodness, hey God, in the land of the living. Know what stock you came from. We are not the forsaken of God or the forgotten of God. We have his strength. Somebody holler, keep living. This ain't new. You need to testify to yourself. And if you're a little bit friendly, since I've been talking about all the nice black folk, look at your neighbor and say, keep living. This ain't new. In spite of slavery, in spite of civil rights, in spite of sharecropping, in spite of less than education, let me tell you what God did. We have 107 HBCUs. 22% of African Americans have been to college. And Trustee Lee said we need to celebrate even if it won't you. We got 22% in a place that they didn't even want us to be. Even though they discriminate against us often with property, 46% of black folk own homes. There were some we could only clean them, but now we can own them. Hey, God, hallelujah. By the grace of God, we've been here before. They forced us into doors that say colored only, say you can only go in the back door. Now we own the door. 3.7 million people own their own business that are black like me. Somebody holler, yes, keep living. Somebody holler, keep living. I mean that thing, we gotta be encouraged and know that there's still some good news. Can't nobody tell our story like us. After all that, I'm still here. Hey God, thank you. We've been here before. I hear my Angelo say, you may write me down in history with your bitter, twisted lies. You may try me in the very dirt, but still like dust, I'll... You got that. 
They hate to see the God in us that allows us to yet rise. So in this, we still will. The last bit of the line says, out of the hurts of history's shame, I rise. Up from the past that's rooted in pain, I rise. So I wish you how to keep living. I got some more, I got some more, I got some more. Somebody holler, keep living. What else about your character? We've been here before. But your character must remain in the test. Listen to what God tells those folk. In verse 5, he said, build houses, live in them, plant gardens, have produce, take wives, make families, and in the middle of all that, multiply. In an oppressive government, they don't like you. They have oppressed you. They have put you in captivity. I still have grace on you to multiply. They don't have the final say. Even though you're in that condition, I'm telling you, you have to stretch out on faith and trust me because they don't have the final say. There's more to grace than what meets the eye. And what he says is, there is a grace on God's people to increase in their Babylon. Here's what he told me to tell you that is sobering if you'll take it. He said, don't miss the grace that's on you in the place that you're in in this season by complaining about what didn't happen. He said, don't miss the grace that is on your life during this time and season by talking about and complaining about what didn't happen. You had your week, you had your moment, it didn't happen, but let it be known. God said there is grace still yet on my life. In spite of the environment, in spite of the circumstances or the leadership, God said, I still got grace on your life. King Nebuchadnezzar was their leader, but he said, build homes, live in them, get married, make families, and multiply. He said, do something with what you got. And if you do something with what you got, I'll multiply it. I'll make it more than you think. I'll shock them. Let the pity party be over and start planting, start building, start trusting God and start giving him what you got and watch him give an increase. I voted. I wanted a specific person, but even if the specific person, my trust remains in the Lord. Some trust in horses, some trust in chariots, but I will trust. He said, don't be so busy complaining and preoccupied that you miss the grace that God has provided for your life. What is the grace? The grace to get up every day. The grace to keep going. The grace to trust God in the dark. The grace to continue. The grace to get up out of bed. The grace to put one foot in front of the other. The grace to believe before I see it. The grace to know that God still has a plan. Somebody ought to keep living. And here's what he said. But there's another grace besides all those I mentioned. There is grace to keep acting like a Christian in a bad situation. Just because they did something don't mean you get to do something. It didn't go my way, so I'm going to turn it out. No, you need to turn down. Because the weapons of my warfare are not 
but they're mighty through God. There you go, there you go, there you go. They're mighty through God. And the pulling down of strongholds, every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. So I have grace to keep being a Christian in a bad situation, to keep being a Christian when I got bad news, when things didn't go the way I wanted them to go. I have the grace to still have the character of Christ. Listen to what he says in verse 6. He says, seek the welfare of the city. You mean a place I don't want to be in? A place I don't like the leader in? The place that I'm sorry that I'm in? The place that I'm afraid of being here and what's going to happen? You said for me to seek the welfare of the city where I sent you? And listen to this and pray for it. Because in its welfare, somebody ought to read that. For in the city's welfare is my welfare. So that's where you may be in a situation, but you can't be like them. So, so somebody put your hand on yourself and say, I can't be like them. I got to keep living, but I can't be like them. I can't be like them. I can't be like them. There is grace on me to still act like the church in a crazy world. I got to keep living like the church. Even when things don't go my way, I got to keep being the church, acting like the church, representing the church. And if I didn't remember who God was, that would seem strange. God, I'm here. I don't want to be here. I got bad news here. I don't want to be here. I don't like it. I don't like the leader. I don't like what any of this stuff you're telling me to do. And yet you're telling me to pray for that city. And telling me that my well-being is wrapped up in theirs. I ain't like them. I don't like them. I'm not just not like them. I don't like them. And yet you're telling me to pray for them. But I shouldn't be surprised because this is the same God who says I will give you rivers in the desert. I will exalt the valleys. I will give you streams in the wilderness. I will bring down the high thing. I will take the simple and confuse the wise. I will take little and become much. I will take the forgotten and exalt them. And he often tells us crazy stuff to do in community. Let me tell you, can I be honest? Because sometimes this sounds crazy. He said, forgive and you shall be forgiven. He'll tell you, you give first. Give and it shall be. In community, you give first. He says, pray for your enemies. And those that deceitfully, despitefully use you. Yeah, them, pray for them. He says, if you pray for your city, because I know where you're at, he said, your welfare. And what that means is your own peace. That translates in the Hebrew word shalom. He said, your peace, I will give you even in a place you don't want to be in. Anybody ever been in a place they didn't want to be in, but yet God gave you peace? You don't even understand it. But somehow God's like, it's like, what? I don't like this. I'm unsure. It's not the place I want to be. But somehow God gives you peace. 
in the middle of it and peace in the midst of it. So this statement, and I hope you can get this. I said in testimony is even when God didn't move me, he moved me. Do you, do you get what? So even when he didn't change my location, he moved something on the inside of me. So sometimes God won't move you physically, but he'll move you internally. That's what he'll do. That even when he doesn't move you, he'll move you. Somebody how to keep living. My character, God's character. Let me keep going with this. We also got to put our confidence in the right place. Even when we get bad news, good people get good, get bad news. We got to put our confidence in the right place. According to verses eight and nine, it says, do not let false prophets or diviners deceive you. Be careful who you listen to. When you're in a bad spot, be careful who you listen to. There's over 3,500 televangelists. Be careful who you listen to. Because if you're a member of this church, God gave you a pastor who seeks God for you. To the people on TV, whether you are a partner or not, you are a number. And when you get sick, and I'm just going to use him as an example, it's nothing again. Is T.D. Jakes coming to your hospital room? If you turn the TV on, maybe. But he ain't coming to lay his hands on you. He said, I will give you shepherds. You don't just need a tele-evangelist. You don't just need a preacher. He said, I will give you shepherds who will watch out for your soul. You got to be careful who you listen to. God has given you a pastor. And you've got God's, and he seeks God on your behalf. So if there was ever a time for discernment, it's now. My prayer is that, Lord, don't let my itching ears and my impatience get me in trouble. I just want a word for the sake of a word. And it might not even be what God is saying. It just feels good. Because what they were doing is the people were coming and talking to the children of Israel, telling them this is going to be over real quick. And Jeremiah said, they lying. Which makes us say in church, we have to be careful what we take in. And it can't just be, it is your season, you're going to be out right away. Sometimes God is going to take you through. But it might not be quick. There are some things that I've been waiting for since 2000. But that don't mean that God ain't going to do it. Listen. You got to be careful who you listen to. I said, don't let my itching ears, my impatience get me into trouble. And when I receive bad news, when I have received something and I'm in a place that I don't want to be in, what I don't need, let me tell you what I don't need. And yes, I am trying to step on your toes because I want you to get into the word of the Lord. I don't need a horoscope. Something to quick to make me feel better. I don't need to read what the psychic is telling me is going to happen when I've got a prophet in the word of God that has already told me. I don't need a horoscope. I don't need a fortune teller. I don't need a psychic. I don't need a palm reader. And I don't even need a motivational speaker. I need a preacher. Hey, God, who has been sent by God. to tell me what the full gospel says. Not the prosperity that just gonna tell me every day is gonna be sunny because there are some rainy days, but in the midst of the rain. 
God is a keeper in the sunshine. God is a keeper in the rain. He is a keeper in the storm. Can anybody testify that God will keep you in the storm? It's not always my season to get. Sometimes it's my season to grow. Somebody let that marinate. It ain't always my season to get. What God is going to give me? What about what I'm going to give him? Sometimes it's my season to grow, not to get. So that I won't stay immature. Saying, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. And the only time God is good is when he does what I want him to do. Those of you who have children, did you give your children everything they wanted every time they asked for it? And you didn't care what they said. Sometimes it's my season to, to give, to grow, to stay put, to be refined, to be purged, to examine myself. Sometimes I'm going to be tested. Sometimes it's not just a season of hooray, hooray. Sometimes I'm going to be tested. And my attitude is the goal, not the stuff. Because he's trying to work on my character and my attitude. Because while the, the scripture says he will bless us, it also says sometimes we have to endure hardship. We have to ensure, endure hardship as a good. Oh, I can't hear you as a good. When I hear the gospel. It's not going to always make me celebrate. Sometimes it's going to make me convicted. Sometimes I can't name it and claim it. I got to go and wait. I got to trust and believe. I got to pray and fast. I got to read and meditate. I got to cry. I got to shout. And I got to keep living, holding on to God. Every season ain't my name and ain't claim it season. It don't mean I'm less than a Christian. It don't mean that I don't have faith. It just means that God said you got to walk through this one. We have made people feel like because they don't have the instantaneous results that other people do, that they are less than a Christian. The devil is a liar. Somebody say keep living. So we can't just listen to prophets who try to make us feel like it's always instantaneous and it's always good. Sometimes it's not good, but he's good. He's good. Somebody how to keep living. Character, my character, his character. Then I said, will we put our confidence and then, finally, we got to stay committed to God. Character, my character, his character. Put our confidence in the right places, and then we got to stay committed to God. Verses 11 through 14. That's when it begins to say what we know. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me and I will listen to you and you will seek me and find me and when you search for me with all your heart, I will be found by you, says the Lord, and I will bring you back from your captivity. I will gather you from all your nations and from all the places where I have driven you, says the Lord, and I will bring you to the place from which I caused you to be carried away captive. We got to stay committed to God. Somebody say, God has a plan. God has a plan. And God's plan won't fail. God's plan won't Say, God has, a plan, God has a plan. And God's plan won't fail. God's 
We have to remain committed to God through all the parts. Let me tell you this quick little story. There was a man who shared a testimony, and it said he went to a play, and then he was so upset by the play, he left, or he was leaving at intermission. He gets his stuff. He's mad about it. He starts walking out, and then a guy stops him, and he's like, where are you going? The play's not over. And he said, I'm sick of this. You know, I, I don't like this play. I, I, I'm, I'm leaving. I, I'm, I'm exiting. I'm, he said, I promise you, if you stay and wait, there will be a reward at the end. He said, don't leave during the intermission. So what God told me to tell you is don't confuse the intermission for God's ending. You're frustrated by the part that you're in right now. But don't confuse the intermission for God's finale. How do I know that there is a finale? Because verse 11 says to the folk that got bad news that were dealing with their sick circumstances and their leader and all their emotions. He said, for I know the plans, oh my God, that I have for you, plans to prosper you. I may not be prospering right now, but God's finale is for me to prosper. I can't confuse the intermission for God's ending, for I know the plans that I have for you, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, to give you life, hope, and an expected end. You want to talk about blessed assurance, I call it blessed reassurance. God is telling me in the midst of what I'm dealing with that you ain't seen nothing yet. Don't you stop being committed to me just because the scene got tricky. Because there's more parts to play, more scenes to be shown, but you got to stay committed and connected. You can't quit when stuff gets tough. But when things get tough, the tough get going. Somebody ought to be able to get up and say, I'm going to stay with God. My commitment is with God. Because in the intermission, it may be tricky, but God told me he has a plan, and the plan is good for me. He said there's a future. Oh, God, thank you. Somebody ought to keep living. It's not over yet. There's a plan that God has with my name on it. Plans to prosper me and not to harm me. Is it good? Yes, it's good. Plans to prosper you, not to you. So I wish you'd say this with me. Keep living, because God ain't finished. God ain't done till God is done. He said, the work I started, I'll see it through to the day of Jesus Christ. The good work I started. There's a finish line, and he's waiting. He's waiting for me to keep on going. There's no expiration date. God has a plan. God ain't done till he's done. So he said, tell the folk, restoration is still on the menu. Restoration is still on the menu. I will restore you. I will restore the years. I'll lift up your heart. I'll keep your mind. I'll keep your body. I'll do it. Restoration is on the menu. Keep living. He's the great I am. He can't lie. He's the God that causes all things to work together for my good. I don't know how, but he's able. I don't know when, but he's able. I don't know how, but he's able. I don't know when, but he's able. Somebody do your hands like this. 
and say he's working. He has a plan. Keep living. And he said, when you come and you call, he said, seek me. You'll find me. He's pushing me to pray. He's pushing me to seek him. He's pushing me to trust him. I got bad news, but I got a good God. Father, I stretch my hands to thee. No other help. I know if thou withdrew thyself from me, where would I go? Thank you. I'll press. Thank you. I'll pray. Thank you. I'll worship. Thank you. I'll trust. Because the Bible says, God is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever and ever. Amen. It is so. Amen. Somebody say, keep living. Keep living. God is the kingdom. I love that. And the power and the glory forever. And how long? Forever. How long? How long? How long? How long? 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 Amen. 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 It is so. Amen. That settles it. Amen. I'm going to do what he said. I'm going to do what he said. Amen. Yay! 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 I want somebody not let me holler by myself. Tell them yay! 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 Don't let me holler by myself. One more time. Yeah. Keep living and trust God. He ain't done. He ain't done. God ain't done till God is done. One more time, hallelujah. Everybody's standing, I'm done. He ain't done, but I'm done. Yay! Put your hand on yourself and remind yourself to keep living. I know you got some bad news. But keep living. Keep trusting God. Keep praising God. Keep praying to God. Keep leaning on God. He said, and then you will seek me and you will find me when you seek me with your whole heart. And he said, then I will gather the things and bring you back to the appointed place. I got some things I need him to gather back. 
I thank him for gathering my children. I thank him for gathering them in the faith that they shall be mighty for him and that I shall see them saved in loving God. I may be the only one trusting and believing for my kids, but if there's anybody else, where you are believing that God is going to let you see your kids loving God, serving God, walking with you. Yay! You may not have kids, but you got nieces, nephews, cousins, people in the neighborhood. Everybody needs the Lord. One last time, and I'm going to open up the doors. Put your hand on yourself. And let this push you to prayer. Because there is grace on you in the midst of this place. But remind yourself to keep living. Say, keep living. I didn't say keep existing. I said, keep living. He said, I came that you might have. Oh, I got some Bible readers in here. I came that you might have. I can't hear you. I came that you might have. And that more abundantly. So I'm not after existence. I want to live. Even in the midst of a crazy environment, he's reminding us people that he's with us. We are not forsaken, we are not forgotten, and we are not without power or weapons. They are our spiritual weapons. You heard the word of the Lord. I preached out of the depths of my heart. So now, and I, and I thank you for that, but I didn't say that for applause. I, I'm saying that because my prayer is that the Spirit of God would touch your heart as you heard the preaching of the gospel. Because my job, it says, faith come by hearing and hearing by the word of the Lord. But how can they hear except there be a preacher? And how can they preach except they are sent? Beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel. So I've been sent here to tell you to keep living. But life is anchored in Christ Jesus. So is there one who would come now to give your heart to the Lord? You heard the preacher say keep living. But the first step is to be anchored in the Lord. Is there one who will come? How about, let's see. Sister Carter, where are you? Can you do uh, the chorus of There's Not a Friend, the Jesus, Jesus, how I trust, how I prove him more. Jesus, 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 precious, precious Jesus, oh for, oh for grace to trust him more, Jesus, 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 how I Thank you for catching that I did. Tis so sweet. Yes, thank you. Tis on Jesus, Jesus. Precious Jesus. Precious Jesus. Oh, for grace. Oh, 
for a church home. It's important. One of the things that will enable you to keep living is your connection to Christian community and family. You need a church home for more than a funeral. It's a place for you to grow. Is there one who will come? Come now. Precious Jesus. Oh, for grace. Is there one who will come? I feel like there's somebody. One more time, and then we're going to take our seats. Jesus, Jesus. Is there one who will come? I feel like there's somebody. All right, you may take your seats. Thank you. Precious. Precious Jesus. Oh, for grace. Oh, for Let's just repeat grace. that last line. Oh, for grace. Trust him more. Oh, for grace. Oh, for grace. Oh, for grace. To trust him more. Oh, for grace. Oh, for grace. Oh, for grace, oh, for grace, to trust him more. Oh, for grace, oh, oh, for grace, to trust him more. I need your grace.
my brother here. He rededicated his life to the Lord. Hallelujah. 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 I ask that you will love on him, encourage him, and encourage him to keep right on living. And before you leave today, I wish you would be so friendly to encourage your neighbor and just tell him to keep on living. And I challenge you this week to write down somewhere and tell yourself to keep on living. God is with me. God has plans for me. So I can't quit at the intermission. I got to see it through to the final act. Trust him. The altar will be open for prayer for those who may want to come or maybe you were ashamed to walk the aisle to join the church or give your life to Jesus. The altar will be open. You can sit in the overflow, but if you leave, easily and quietly and respectfully, I love you with the love of the Lord. And remember, when good people get bad news, our answer is to trust God and keep on living. Trust Him for grace to trust Him Keep on living. 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 I know we're not supposed to point, but find somebody to point to and tell them to keep on living. 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 Oh, oh. to him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think and it's according to the power that's working in us unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages world without end amen remember to go in the cold room remember to go in the cold room Men, rib rally, and man cave events. Keep on living.